Have you got a uh, brilliant pricey of the plot? So, so you want a summary of what the... Uh, yeah. Okay. It takes place after uh, Kainji Dam bursts, and Kainji Dam is, is a real dam in Nigeria. It's a hydroelectric dam. And um, it bursts and kills a million people. So that's an actual prognosis for what will happen to the dam, because it hasn't been properly maintained since it was built in the 60s. And around this disaster, uh, a whole range of characters converge. Reason being, for me, that around disasters, different people converge. So <laughs> you've got government, you've got finance, multinational corporations, and you also have NGO sector, which to some extent is also an industry in itself. So all those sectors converge. The, the basic question of the book is, is access to water a human right, or is water a commodity? And so the characters who come uh, to look at this as uh, quite fortuitous, you've got the Minister for Natural Resources who's just ecstatic, this is great. He can now attempt to accede to the presidency, so this is a, a real stroke of luck. And then you have Transaqua also saying, wow, this is fantastic. Uh, we can now bid for the rights to the Niger River um, because the, the country is in a, a state of real weakness. Um, and then you have the person who's heading up the bid, the Transaqua Mary Glass, uh, has a, a strong, there's a strong rivalry between her and her sister, Barbara Glass. So Barbara decides to become part of an NGO that's going to contest this um, sale. Um, so initially she wants to be something like Che Guevara, so she, you know, she likes put it, you know, see how the beret fits and so on. And then, uh, so her, her position is, I'm going to go to Nigeria to show Nigerian activists how to mobilize, you know, how to mount a campaign. But when she goes to Nigeria, she's changed slowly, and she comes to really appreciate the situation. Um, and, um, and then she starts to try to teach them about pacifism. <laughs> so the guy who becomes prime minister. Oh, um, yes, president, uh, yeah. Kolo. Uh, what great character, because he just gets uh, more rotten and squirrelier as, as the book goes along. Uh, yes. Well, yes. I, w I was hoping to show, and I may not have been successful, but I was hoping to show that when you get to a certain point in a person's life, you, you have to almost look back to see what took them to that certain point. So uh, he becomes increasingly um, paranoid and so on. But when you look at what, what were the formative incidents in his life and the, the, the drowning of his twin, uh, whether he did it or whether it was an accident, and the fact that the entire village refused to speak to him from that point onwards, then you start to understand how he can become who he is. Uh, and it's the same with this notion of people in the family. The family creates a system where you want to please. Um, so when you go out into the wider world, you want to please and be accepted and acknowledged and so on. So this is what corporations use, I believe, um, to create that kind of loyalty that you'll need in a corporation. So you don't want your, your division or your, your, I don't know, your uh, group to be the worst one in the company, so you're, you're you know, charging ahead. E whether or not you agree with the principles of that corporation, you're still doing your best. And then uh, it's the same in NGO sector and so on. So I was just trying to look at the foundations of personality and how, I don't think a six-year-old, you know, somebody is born and then they're six and they think, I wonder, wonder which country I can <laughs> exploit when I'm older, you know, I actually don't think that that's what her occurs. You seem so sweet and nice. Oh dear. You killed a million people in the opening of the book, you know, and and you're, you know, you're merciless satirist. So, uh, could you reconcile that for me? Well, I am really sweet. I'm just one of the most wonderful people you could ever meet. Don't ever take your eyes off that. Okay? And thank you for Those that $20 bill to, to listen to that. I appreciate that. Uh, well, 
When I first read that the Kanji Dam, when it ruptures, will kill a million people, I was really, really upset. It really, really upset me. Uh, so, just trying to find a way of, of raising the profile of that in a way that allows people to consider it almost entertainment or entertainment while getting the message. And um, so that's what I did. But, you know, yes, it is, it is a, I had a friend who said, oh, you're a very angry woman, aren't you? <laughs> I was going, you what? I don't think so. <laughs> and she said, this book, I mean, it just butchers people. <laughs> so I suppose I must be secretly really, really something wrong with me. <laughs> I do understand. This is this crazy thing about writing satire. Is you're writing it, and then you suddenly read what you've written that you thought was really wild and unbelievable has just taken place. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's the problem with you know with writing satire. Yeah. I, I, I hope this book uh, does dangerously well for you. Oh, thank you very much. A lot of fun. Thank you. The book is doing dangerously well. I've been speaking with the author Carol Anaharo and Doing Dangerously Well, published by Random House of Canada.